Hey everybody, it's the Coffee with a Geek program, second interview of 2022. Um, it is, geez, I'm losing track of the day. It's March going almost into April, still have snow here in Western New York. With me today is a really awesome guest, as always, uh, Melissa Dean. And Melissa, I came across you as I, most of my guests on Twitter, and I see a great post, a thought-provoking idea, or in this particular case, I saw someone post about you. <laughs> and that piqued my curiosity. I said, hmm, somebody's complimenting somebody on, on Twitter. That's usually a good sign. And it was, um, I love that because Twitter can be an angry place, but that was a really nice, positive, um, good vibes feed from Twitter, which I loved. But uh, let me introduce Melissa Dean. She is a seventh grade teacher in southeastern Manitoba, Canada. She has been a classroom educator for 20 years. And as I can tell you, it goes by really fast. Uh, and you've been spanning grades one through 12. So a lot of experience in different grade levels. She is passionate about assessment and grading reform and mathematics education. And in her spare time, she enjoys drinking coffee. That's a perfect segue. Uh, running, writing, and baking sourdough bread. That's good. I like that. I like all of those. So, uh, Melissa, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Uh, let's start off with the toughest question. What's your favorite blend of coffee? My favorite blend of coffee? Well, I'd have to say, um, to be stereotypical, my, my favorite blend of coffee is actually the Pike Place blend from Starbucks. Uh, that's my go-to. Um, but actually, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, my favorite blend of coffee is also from Starbucks. It's called the Cassie Cielo blend. And it comes out at Christmas time. It's sort of a chocolatey undertone, nice and mellow. I'm a big fan of a nice, a nice mellow cup of coffee with some cream in it. Um, that's definitely one of my happy place go to uh, go to accessories is to have a cup of coffee with me. <laughs> it sounds delicious. Sounds really good. I mean, what can go wrong? Is it chocolate and coffee? You know, exactly. It's a pretty good combination. So, as I, I mentioned in the intro, I saw a Twitter uh, link that said. Uh, you were the inspiration for them. And I thought that was really wonderful. And then I started looking through your feed and thought, wow, this person's really doing some interesting things. And I also saw that you have a blog and you have a book and all this good stuff. So all of that, just from one tweet from, I believe it was a former student of yours, kind of sparked it. So I reached out to you. So uh, what's the secret for you, I guess, for inspiring your students? Let's start with kind of a very wide angle uh, yeah I, that's, a, that's a really good question um and i've been reflecting on that a lot recently um just because i've had some really great feedback from students and parents as well recently um and sort of reflecting on what is it that i do that is that does make make a connection and it's more than just making a connection with your students i think there's something to be said um for the rawness and the realness of authenticity uh, in the classroom. Um, and I think that also comes across uh, in Twitter as well. And I think about like, why are other people, how are other people being influenced or inspired by me and my journey? And I think um, part of that has been that I've been very raw and very real um, with my own journey as an educator and the things I question and the things I struggle with. And I know sometimes I give a voice to things that probably other people are thinking, um, but maybe haven't found their voice yet. And I think that really draws people into connection. And so I think with my students, um, the fact that I am very real um, and, and authentic with them, I think they can see it. Um, and that draws them more into more than just a connection. I think it really builds a relationship. Um, and that spills over into my, uh, my, into my colleagues, I hope, but I know it, for sure it has spilled over into uh, my social media um, work and my blog and my writing. Um, those are things that I use to help share that voice. Yeah, I really liked what you said about authenticity. I think that's, I think that's inspiring. At least you're, you're being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you think and you kind of maybe uh, hit on this a little bit without saying it completely, but you think being a truth teller, I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, teachers need to be truth tellers. Is that? A yeah, I think, 
I think they do. I think that that's, um, I think that's a part of the job that we don't always know about when we go into education. I think when we, when we, when I, certainly when I became a teacher, being a truth teller or um, giving a voice to things wasn't on my radar. Um, and I think it only recently for me has become part of my, my story to be a truth teller. Um, and I think I would like to see it be part of more people's journey. And I think that's probably why I feel compelled to be a truth teller and to tell my story and to share sort of the ideas and questions and doubts that I have in my own mind, that things that I wrestle with. Um, and I hope that that gives courage to other people, other teachers um, and people working in education, but also just in general, I think it goes beyond more than just being an education, just being part of the human race, excuse me, I think being willing to, to speak, to speak into and to speak to people with that authenticity of, of voice is something that uh, needs to be cultivated more. And I think we don't always do a very good job of it in education. I think we do a really good job of giving students our voice and not giving them their own voice. And I think helping people, I think by me speaking my truth and sharing my ideas, that's helping other people find voices for their students. And I think that that is something that's really, really important. You know, and as you were talking, uh, it kind of brought back a phrase I use and my friends are probably annoyed by it for me using it probably too much, but. I always say life doesn't imitate art. It imitates the Wizard of Oz. And mm. I, I often come back to that story, despite the fact that the Wizard of Oz scared me to death when I was a kid, uh, the <laughs> Wicked Witch and, you know, the monkeys and the, um, the yes. but I think all great endeavors and all great uh, pieces of human, human beings need to be heart, mind, and especially courage. And you mentioned courage in your answer mm -hmm. there. So. I think mm -hmm. it does take courage to often speak truths that may not be popular or. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and when you are in a field that is, um, when you're in a public field where, where you're, the, people see what you do, um, it takes even more courage. And I think even just the act of, the act of learning itself is an act of courage. And I feel like that's part of my calling as an educator is to give my students uh, and my colleagues a space where they can learn to be courageous and, and learn. Okay, so let's talk about your educational journey. This is one of my favorite kind of questions because it gives me a kind of broad scale of how you got into teaching and I'm always fascinated by the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your journey? Where did, you, where did it start? Where is it going? Um, it started with me as a teenager saying that I knew for sure there was two things I didn't want to do with my life. And that was, I didn't want to be a doctor and I didn't want to be a teacher. Those were the things that I was positive <laughs> of as a teenager. Right. <laughs> Absolutely not going to be a teacher. And I was very vocal about saying and telling my parents I was not going to be a teacher. I'm not sure what I had against being a teacher, but I just felt like I knew that that wasn't going to be for me. Um, so my intention coming out of high school and going into university was to be a laboratory scientist. And I did my, I did a four year uh, science degree in uh, microbiology and immunology. And that was where I was going to work. I was going to work in that field. But then in my fourth year, I realized something from sitting around the cafeteria, chatting with my, my fellow classmates was that as much as I loved the content, I I loved talking with other people about questions that they had and clarifying things. And I, I realized that what I really loved almost as much as the science was helping people understand the science. And so that began my journey when I realized, you know what, as much as I always said when I was growing up that I didn't want to be a teacher, I think I feel a calling into that field. Uh, and so I did my teaching, um, I, after my fourth year of science, 
degree. I did a teaching uh, degree, which is which was one year at the time in uh, Ontario, and intended to be a high school science teacher and uh, found myself starting out that way. So I started my career in a private school teaching uh, high school science. Um, really loved that position, but wanted to work in the public system. I felt felt called away from the private system because I think the school that I, and I share a little bit about this journey in my book um, as well, the, the school I worked at when I first started my, my teaching career was a lovely place to start my career, but I felt boxed in there. I, I already felt that there was more that I was going to be called to, and I needed a little bit more space to do that. So I decided to do, leave my full-time position. I resigned in hope that I would find a full-time position in the public system, which at the time was a very, uh, it was a very courageous move. It was a very much a leap of faith. Most people were very surprised that I was giving up my, my permanent contract position at a private school and hoping that I would land on my feet in the public system. Because at the time, the teaching profession was very saturated in Ontario and it was very hard to get a job. Uh, after that, I was able to be a substitute teacher for a few months, and then I did end up getting a permanent contract position as a music teacher. So I went from being a high school science teacher to being a music teacher, but along with that came a homeroom. So I became a, a grade eight uh, generalist teacher at the same time as I was teaching instrumental music. And part of my, my journey that I always like to share with people that's very surprising uh, to them when they meet me now is um, I was a very, as a student, very, um, I was not a good math student. I struggled greatly in mathematics, felt I wasn't a math person, didn't want to do math anymore. I, I went, I, I did my first year math in university and was happy to say goodbye to math for what I thought was the rest of my life until I found myself having to teach math to grade eights. And I had a moment of lightning hit me in the classroom when I realized one day as I stood in front of the classroom, I was teaching math to my students the way I had been taught and the looks on their faces just so mirrored what I had felt as a math student, this almost sort of shame I felt that, that I didn't understand math. And so that sent me on my own sort of professional learning action research journey into finding a better way, a different way to teach mathematics. And so the last sort of 10 years of my career has been focused on math education and doing my own research and trying things out. And uh, I've become very, very passionate about mathematics education reform. I have found a love for mathematics that I didn't think I would ever, <laughs> that I would ever have after my experiences as a student. Um, because I realized as part of my educational journey that the math that I experienced as a student is not at all what mathematics really is. So my call, I feel like as an educator now, I was again, also unexpectedly thrust into leadership by some principals who had saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. I certainly never intended to be in any sort of leadership position, but uh, some principals at various times came alongside me and kind of gave me a bit of a nudge and said, we need to hear more of your voice. Um, and so I've stepped into a variety of unofficial and official leadership roles uh, within my school buildings, wherever I have found myself. And now I'm known as the math, part, for two things. I'm known now as the math, the math girl. Um, if you have a question about teaching math and how to do it, you should go see Mrs. Dean. Um, but equally as passionate, the thing I love to talk about almost as much as I love to talk about mathematics is I somehow fell into being really, really interested in how we assess and evaluate learning within the school system. And I mean, nobody wants to talk about that. That's sort of like an elephant in the room. You know, we talk about instructional reform and we talk about class sizes and class management and all those things. We'd like to talk about those kinds of aspects of teaching, but 
talking about assessment and evaluation and grading, it's, it's becoming a little bit more of an open conversation now, but um, I find mostly that that's part of, the, part of the journey that nobody really wants to talk about because it's a little bit scary to talk about and to think about the kinds of big changes that I think we need to see within the school system. So now I find myself as a, you know, 20 years in, which just boggles my mind that it's been 20 years. I don't know. Sometimes I look around and think like, when did I, when did I become the old teacher in the school building? I used to be like this young, cool teacher and oh, brand yeah. new, and now I'm like the old seasoned veteran. Uh, I still feel like a brand new teacher. I will say that uh, even 20 years in, I have colleagues, you know, younger colleagues, like, when does it, when do you start to feel like you've got it all figured out? And I'm like, you don't. Um, I always uh, used to say to my colleagues too, like if I ever tell you that I've figured this game, you know, figured out how to be a teacher, then you should tell me I should retire because <laughs> that's a sign about of something. Yeah, but that's, that's where true. I find myself now. I've, I've, I've journeyed through, you know, wanting to be a science teacher to being a music teacher. And, you know, I was a special education teacher in there at, at one point as well. and but have found myself you know, sort of landed in this in this place now where I teach. I love to teach grade seven. They're they're great. It's a great age. Middle school is a great age to to hang out with. You want to be kept on your toes. Um, I know all grades have their have their quirks, but uh, the middle years is is a special bunch. Um, and so yeah, that's that's kind of where I started from not wanting to be a teacher at all to now I can't even imagine what I would do if I wasn't in education in some capacity. Yeah, there was, there was something there was interesting, interesting as you were talking. I was thinking about um, you know my own teaching as well. I was an elementary teacher, and you know I came from a science background, a biology major, and I felt like that was my most challenging subject to teach science, and I didn't enjoy it because. I had such a high level of it and it was really difficult for me to, to break it back down, to get to that, um, you know, that yeah. level of early, you know, awakenings for science. Whereas like you said, the math was a lot more fun because it wasn't such a, a, something that came so easy to me. And, and I was able to kind of relay the struggles that I had to my students. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I think that's been a really crucial part of, for me, from my story and part of, I hesitate to use the word success, but um, to be somebody who was, a, who was a struggling math student, I think that's partly what makes me a fantastic math teacher is because I can see and understand the struggle. And, and I know I've had to break the math down for myself to learn it. Um, and so then, then I'm doing that again for my students. Whereas I think if the math came easy to me, I'm sure there's some fantastic math teachers um, who are super strong mathematicians as well. But for me in my journey, knowing that, that part of the fact that I struggled so much in math is partly why I feel like I've become a really good, a really good math teacher um, is because, because of, I can relate to some of that struggle that my students have. And you also, you know, brought up assessment and, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of, of doing a, a TED talk, although no one would ask me to do a TED talk ever, but just um, things teachers don't talk about, but they should. And yeah. assessment is one of those. And I think we, I, I think we feel at the whim, at least here in the States, you know, like, well, the state says we got to give this test. So I'm going to give those tests and that's the way it is. And I'll, I'll complain about it, but you know, We'll just keep going with it. And um, I think the data behind tests and, 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 and are tests appropriate or good, or are they measuring what we want them to measure? We don't have those conversations enough because nobody asks us for our opinion, quite frankly, uh, as far as like the statewide goes. And so we just don't talk about them, but I think we need to talk about them. So with that being said, um, you blog and your blog is really fascinating. I read a couple of good pieces and I want to talk about one of them. And it was relatively recent, probably within the last couple of weeks. And the title of the blog post was, it's going to be a bloodbath. <laughs> That's a pretty provocative title. Uh, can you talk about, uh, I guess, blogging? We'll, we'll come to that question in a second, but tell me about that post and then tell me about blogging and why you like yeah. to blog or 
that post came out of a conversation. I uh, before school, I I walked into the photocopy room and one of my colleagues was there photocopying a test and. Uh, it was uh, on one of the subjects that I know tends to be a challenging one for students. It was using nets and finding surface area of sort of complex figures. And I kind of offhandedly made the, made the comment to her like, oh, that looks like it's gonna be fun. And, she, and then she turned to me and said, it's going to be a bloodbath. And we both kind of laughed and sort of went on to kind of sort of chuckle about, you know, yeah, it's gonna be you know, really difficult. And then I talked to her a little bit about some of, of the way that she runs tests in her class, which I actually think is kind of a neat, a neat way with giving feedback right away. But afterwards, I, I felt immediately compelled to write about it because I realized I'm like, oh, I mean, as much as you know, she she made that comment and I laughed alongside of her. I realized I, I came to this moment of like, oh wow, like how 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 do we come to a place where we're going to give something to our students that for them to to do that we know is going to be a bloodbath it, we know is going to not go well we we already know right away it's not going to go well which then left me reflecting on like then why on earth would we do it if we know if we know for sure or we, we feel certain that i'm going to give kids this test and it's going to be terrible there's probably going to be crying. Why would we? Why would we do that? And so, that's been part of the whole journey that I've talked to people about assessment on. Is you know why are we? It comes down to the why question. Like why are we doing this? Why are we giving this test? Why are we giving this assignment? Why why are we giving a test now? Why are we giving a test at all? I mean, we in, in Ontario and in under the Canadian system. We don't have mandated state testing or mandatory tests we have to worry about. There's a, there's a few, there's one in Ontario, but it's not nearly the same sort of pressure that I know is part of the American system. Um, so when we, when I, I left that conversation really reflecting on like com coming back to that, why, why do we assess the way we assess and why would we ever find ourselves in a situation where we, we're going to give our students something that we know is going to be terrible? Um, and I really wished I could have had a further conversation with that colleague and kind of delve into the, that a little bit and just kind of say like, oh, you know, how did you know, how did you know that they were ready for the test? Like, why did we decide, why did you decide to give the test today if you knew it was going to be a bloodbath? Why, 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 why? why? <laughs> Why did you feel that, that how did you know that they're ready? Maybe you didn't know they're ready. And that pressure we feel, especially in mathematics, which I think is different from other curriculum areas, we feel this pressure to get through the curriculum standards in a certain time frame. Um, and there's that element of like, well, at some point I have to give a test and move on. Um, and what I would what I would want to say to that and what, what I wrote about in that particular blog was, um, can we get to a point where we feel where we can release that and not feel like we have to get to a certain place and then we have to move on, knowing that not all of our students are ready to move on. They're not all with us yet. They're not all successful yet. Um, because I think we can get to a point where all of our students have demonstrated some elements of success with a, with a particular standard before we have to move on. So. That was kind of the inspiration for that particular post. Yeah, and really tied into what we talked about before about uh, having that conversation about assessment. And, you know, I think back to my teacher training days, you know, one of my kind of, uh, I, I could choose this in my, in my course, it was just educational psychology, but the course was really all about assessment. And uh, the, professor was Dr. Ronald Gentile. He's from University of Buffalo. And I, I want to give him so much credit. He inspired me. And, and, and I'm going almost on 28 years. And I still remember his quotes from taking his course. And I remember one of them that he would say often is, if you want your students, if, if the proof is in the pudding, have your students make pudding, you know. Um, and the other big concept that I would walk away from was, um, you know, he, 
he started off the class by breaking down assessment and data and statistics and all of that and showed that most times we give tests and the st- a statistical analysis is completely arbitrary. It's, it's just a judgment call that a teacher created this kind of arbitrary goal. And it really doesn't, you know, val- it doesn't show what you want it to show. And which brings me to his other saying was, you know, he said he'd had conversations with his colleagues and said, well, I only had, you know, five failures this year. And he said, you let your students fail, you know, and mm-hmm. he said it almost comically, but it, he meant it. It's like, it shouldn't be good that you're letting your students fail. That's, that's a reflection on you, not mm-hmm. them. Um, and it's also a reflection that you were willing to give up on them. Um, and it, and it kind of ties into the, to the bloodbath thing. If you walk into a test knowing your kids aren't doing it, aren't going to do well, what is that saying? You know, yeah. um, and should you give the test if, if that's your, <laughs> that's your yeah. mindset going into it? Um, yeah. And, you know, again, we as teachers know, well, you got to give tests. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. We've got to do the hoops. And sometimes, again, we, we don't stop to have uh, conversations about what's yeah. assessment. And I think yeah. your blog post and you just saying that um, is so important. Um, I think one of the things, too, that we, we need to address, too, with teachers is that notion of, and you touched on it a little bit as well, like, you know, I don't know that we're always assessing what we think we are assessing. Um, and you know that coming coming back down to that too, right? Like, you know, if you really look at your our assessments, whether they're you know unit tests or high stakes assessments or, or or even just a quiz, you know what is it that you are really assessing with that with that tool, and do you really need to? Um, I think that's a question that's got to be part of the conversation. Yes, a good assessment is going to be challenging. Um, it really is. And um, not to, to go too deep into it, but um, the course that I took with, with Dr. Gentile, he said, you know, letter grades are, again, they're arbitrary. They're, they're based on almost phantom data. Mm-hmm. So what he did was he had, three, uh, he had three tests that you had to pass through mastery. So you had to get 80% above. Now that really upped the ante on your studying, I must say, because I've never studied so hard. If and and if you didn't pass, again, based on his his kind of thought of I don't let my students fail, if you didn't pass, you had to come back to his office, you had to go through the, the questions you missed, and he was going to give you an alternate assessment. Oh. He, was, he was gonna make you take, you know, again, a smaller assessment based on what you missed, but he wasn't gonna let you get away with not knowing the material. Oh. Again, so it was a motivator for the student, but it was also like, I care about you knowing the content and I don't want you not to know it. And, you know, and all three of his tests would have questions from the previous, you know, past. So it wasn't, you couldn't let that go. You had to, yeah. you had to constantly go back and refresh yourself from, from the past. But so that was part of his grading system. He said, if you pass all three tests, you get a C and you're like, a C? Like, he's like, yeah, if you want the C, there it is, pass those three tests. He said, if you want a B, you have to pass the three tests and you have to write a, like a five page paper. And the paper was pass fail. <laughs> so and we're all like, pass fail, you know, pass fail. <laughs> so of course you try and do your best work because you don't know what he's gonna, is he gonna throw, throw it out for grammar? Is he gonna throw it out yeah. for content? Is he gonna, is he gonna look at your paragraph? You know, so you you did your best paper ever because you knew you didn't want to. It was pass fail. You didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> so yeah. over, over a spelling error, you know. Um, and then he said, so that gets you the B, the three tests that. And then the final thing was he said, do if you want an A, pass the three tests, pass fail the second essay, and then there's a, another essay that's a ten page. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was 10 page, so five page, 10 page, a 10 page serious essay on these topics. And again, pass fail. So um, I never learned so much in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the grade was a, 
was C, C, B or, or A. I mean, you could get a zero if you didn't do anything, but um, it, it just blew my mind. And I, 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 I've often wondered like, why do we, why do we all, why are we so stuck on the 91 or the, you know, the 85 or the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. We could, we could talk about this topic, I think for a long, long time. I think so too. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I wanted to touch on that you said there that is really just like resonating with me so much right now is, is, you know, like this notion of, of why are we content to let kids not know the content, right? Like I, and why, why are kids at the same time, like, like I have kids in my class who would be absolutely content to do nothing and to learn nothing and, and, and just think about like, like on, on one hand as a student, why, why do they feel okay with that? And then as a teacher in the room, how do I, how could I ever be okay with, with, with letting them not, not be successful? Um, and just the way you phrase that as part of that conversation, that just really, that just really hit me right there. I'm like, oh, that's, that's going to be a blog post, I think. <laughs> well, you can quote Dr. Ronald Gentile from, from University of Buffalo. He's, Absolutely. I'll never forget the course. Uh-huh. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over the ed tech trends to look for, though, if you have a quick one, uh, feel free to shout it out. But I want you to tell me about your podcast and your book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, my, my podcast is just a little, it's a baby podcast. It's something that I just recently started. Um, and the episodes are very short. They're usually no more than five minutes. And one of the things I really felt called to um, is teachers are so pressed for time for professional learning and and new ideas and and those kinds of things that sometimes I felt like I want to be able to help teachers on their journey and drop in little ideas of things that they can do, that they could think about or do sort of immediately. That would be immediately accessible and immediately implementable in our classrooms or at the the same time might be just a thought provoking sort of question in order to get people thinking um, as they're heading into their classroom. So my podcast is, um, I I aim to sort of record one once a week, but right now it's been once a month since I've been working on um, some writing projects. Um, Whenever sort of the fancy hits me really of of an idea or a, 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 an idea or a strategy or an activity that I think is really impactful for classroom learning. Um, Whenever that sort of strikes me, then I record it live. I don't script it. I just sort of have a conversation with myself really about um, about that idea. So my most recent uh, episode that I recorded is about um, a thinking protocol or thinking strategy called hexagonal, a hexagonal thinking, which is a discussion tool that can be used sort of in any content area that gets kids thinking about connections and really deepening their understanding of a particular topic. And I used it in my math class, I used it in my science class, I tried it out in my social studies class, and it was something that I found really, really um, to be really beneficial for my learners and also for me to get to know what my students know and don't know. And so I just like, this needs to be a podcast. And um, so sometimes ideas become podcasts and some, sometimes they become blogs depending on um, how I'm feeling that day, really. <laughs> sometimes it becomes both. Um, I might podcast about an idea that I have and then also blog about it because I know it reaches different audiences. Um, but it's just something, again, my whole goal right now is to get ideas into the, the hands and minds of other educators and as many different ways that I can do that, um, which is why I'm really active on Twitter. It's why I blog. Um, my blog is where I first found my voice and have found that that has been a medium that really has been impactful for people who read it. Um, and so same with my podcast, I thought this is just another platform where I can help 
inspire and share my story and be courageous for other educators. And, and so my book was also was also just exactly that. It was been had been rumbling around inside my brain for a long time. Um, I knew I wanted to write. I've always felt called to write, which is why I started my blog. I wasn't um, sure how I was going to do any writing. I just felt called to write. And then I was approached by the company that's my publisher that in the, this past summer. They asked me if I would be willing, if I had any interest on in doing some more formal writing about assessment and evaluation. And of course I was like, absolutely, that you, you're speaking my language. That's exactly what I would love to write about. Um, and so being able to take those ideas and bring them to life in a larger format in a way that I hope is really accessible to other educators. I knew that I didn't want it to be a very you know, huge, long, difficult read. I wanted it to read very much like a blog very much like my blog post in, in the same sort of style, the same voice that I have in my blog. Um, it was such a, such a joy for me to write, to get those ideas out. Um, and now to see it in the hands of other educators, I've always felt like, I mean, it's, it'd be great if it was really successful and lots of people, excuse me, lots of people read it. But if only one person reads it and, and it, and it causes that one person to reflect on their practices, then that's, that's my goal. Um, would I like to change the world? Absolutely. Do I hope to change the world of, even of, of one person, which then has a ripple effect to their students and their colleagues? There's nothing more I can ask for than being able to do that through that medium. Wow, that's awesome. That's a great way to kind of wrap things up here too. Um, but we still have our speed geek questions. So let's rattle through some of those and I'll turn you loose. And so let's see, I'm going to actually, let's see if I can share my screen and we can get the questions on the, on the board here. So let's do this and let's do there. Okay. Here it goes. Can you see my screen? I can see most of it. Okay, yeah, let's see if we can't. Uh, there, there we go, okay. Here we go. Oh, and what's your favorite tablet? iPads, Kindle, anything like that? Oh, no, that's a hard question. Um, my, favorite, my favorite tablet I would have to say is my iPad, um, mostly because I modified my iPad to have a, I'm not sponsored by Paperlike, but I put a paper-like screen protector on it so it feels like writing on paper. And that was a game changer for me. I, I used my iPad briefly in the classroom uh, and I have an Apple Pencil and I was using it. Didn't love the way it looked or felt. But once I put that screen protector on there, it be, that became a game changer for me. And I use it extensively in my classroom all the time. Wow, cool, okay. I'll have to check into those. I've never seen that. Yes, do it. If you have an Apple Pencil, it's brilliant. What's a, oh, here's the question that we kind of skipped over. What's a tech trend you want to watch for? Yeah, one of the things I'm watching for and that I've had the chance to try out in the ed tech world particularly is apps and platforms that are used to help teachers gather authentic, in-the-moment, real-time assessment. There's a couple of them that are just starting to be really developed uh, for that purpose. Um, that are kind of um, easy to use portfolio makers or just act tools that allow you to gather data right, right in the moment. Um, there's two of them that I've been trying out um, for some developers and those are really, um, those are gonna be something to watch for because I think they're gonna be really game changers in helping share the conversation around how we change assessment. Nice, all right, we'll do one more. Oh, same one. Let's try it again. That was supposed to take them away. One second. Okay, favorite social network. Oh, definitely Twitter. Um, I use I use all the other ones, um, Instagram, and you know, sort of scroll through TikTok once in a while, and have a Facebook profile. But definitely, as, especially as an educator, if you're looking for professional development and a community to build your your own professional learning. Twitter is the place to do it. I, that's why I, was my, some of my best advice that I give to younger teachers is that if you don't have a Twitter account, make a Twitter account as a teacher 
and find some find your teaching niche community on there because honestly that's been in 20 years some of the best professional learning I have done has been through Twitter for sure. Great. Yeah. I, I, I like it too. Like I said, it got a little crazy last year and sometimes it gets a little too hot for me. So I have to kind of take a little break, but I do agree who you follow uh, and you can kind of filter your conversations to ones that are uh, meaningful to you. So Melissa, it has been great talking to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and keep up the great work. I'll be following your blog and Twitter and uh, all good stuff. So thank you so much. It's been all a right. pleasure to talk with you today. All right. Thanks so much.